Welcome to part four of this PowerPoint presentation on how to think like a school math genius. So I left off with this this uh, teaser, which I'm just going to leave leave out there. Um, you know, I guess we've trained our students to be comfortable with just things being mysterious and strange. As long as it gets the answer, then we seem to be satisfied. <sighs> um, here's a quick calculus example for those that teach calculus. Um, I don't memorize the quotient rule, and I don't memorize this this inverse derivative rule. Um, I guess, the, you know, obviously some things do need to stick in your head. I mean, I would say to work out the quotient rule, I'd differentiate uh, f times g to the negative 1 and use the product rule instead. Uh, to differentiate, uh, work out the derivative of an inverse, I'd actually just basically use the chain rule on this composition identity. Because what is the inverse is that which undoes f. Um, hit both sides of the derivative and you're fine. I guess you do have to memorize some things every now and then. I guess I'm advocating memorizing the product rule and the chain rule, but I'm going to keep it at a minimum. I'm really going to avoid memorizing as much as I can. Um, I have seen standardized test questions actually expect kids to know both these formulas pretty much cold. You know, I can rederive them, yes, but it takes me, you know, just, what, an extra five seconds. But, you know, under a standardized test when there's lots of pressure, five seconds is, is, is a disadvantage. So I think it's kind of sad that actually we make kids memorize this stuff. <sighs> Let that go. Anyhow, math geniuses. Principle number five are very clear on what they don't know, and they're quite comfortable to admit that they don't know it. That's fine. It's fact, it's very good to admit you don't know something. Um, there's no shame in not knowing. Um, in fact, this is good. One really needs to struggle and really flail with ideas in order to truly understand them, to really internalize them, to make them really own, to really just have them in your brain. And you often need to see why something doesn't work to really properly understand why what you do does work. So understanding why things don't work is important understand, to understand why things do. For example, here's lots of annoying questions I can ask about the number zero. Is zero an even number or an odd number? Good question. Is negative zero the same as positive zero? Also a hard question. In fact, I'll find a lot of students and teachers too will give me answers that say the answer is negative zero because they've worked out some quantity and had negative sign, so the answer is negative zero. Is it the same as zero? Hard. In fact, let's go back a step. Is zero even a counting number? What does zero count? Um, when I say there are zero giraffes in this room, am I actually counting lack of giraffes? Or am I just noticing a lack of giraffes? Good question. Or why can't we divide by zero? No crazy question. That, in fact, many grade schoolers will ask, why can't we divide by zero? In fact, let me tackle that one a little bit. Let's talk about division just for a moment. 20 divided by 5, we like to say is 4. How do I check myself? Well, let's, let's do the inverse process. 4 times 5 is 20. Great. So then what's wrong with dividing by zero? So if I said 5 divided by zero is 2. Well, the trouble is with that. If I does it pass my check, does 2 times 0 equal 5? No. Okay, I was wrong. So 5 divided by 0 is not 2. Maybe it's 7. Does that pass the check? No. 7 times 0 is not 5. It's 13. Nope. 13 times 0 is not 5. In fact, you can see, no matter what number you put there, try to put there, 5 divided by 0 has no meaningful answer. So that's often a reason why people say you can't divide by 0. If you do the multiplication check, nothing will pass that check. Great. So, except for a 0 divided by 0, that's actually fine. The answer is, in fact, 17. And I know I'm right because it's passed my check. 17 times 0 is 0. So I guess you can divide by 0 most any time, except for 0 divided by 0 is actually fine. It's 17. <laughs> um, I really don't understand exponents. For example, 2 to 3. I was trained as a kid to say that's 2 times 2 times. That's 2 multiplied by itself 3 times. And 2 to the 5 would be 2 multiplied by itself 5 times. Grand. In which case, 2 to the 1 makes no sense to me. 2 multiplied by itself one time. I really don't know what that means. If I think about it, I really don't know what that means. 2 multiplied by itself one time. Um, yet alone 2 to the 0. 2 multiplied by itself 0 times. That doesn't make any sense. What about 2 to the negative 1? 2 multiplied by itself negative 1 times. 2 to the half. 2 multiplied by itself half a time. Is that 1? I don't know. I don't know. If I really think about it, I don't know what exponents mean. Um, maybe you come up with a slightly different definition. In fact, some people will do this. Fold paper. If I take a strip of paper and fold it in half once, I see that one fold in this picture, if, you, if that makes sense to you, looks like a strip of paper fold in half once, gives me two layers. So maybe two to the one, two to the one fold is two. Because if I fold it again in, in half again, I see two folds, gives me four layers. Two for the two folds is four. I guess two to the three folds would be eight. I don't know if you can see that in your mind, but it'll double the number of layers again. Great, so maybe that's the way I can get hold of this. In fact, that makes sense of two to the zero for me. Zero folds clearly corresponds to one layer. Okay, it has helped me. I know what 2 to the 0 means now. What about negative 1 folds? 
that I think I can actually make sense of this. I need to undo a folding, which I guess would be like peeling the paper apart. So I'll peel open the paper, and if I do that, I'd see that I'd have half as thick paper. So maybe two of the minus one equals a half. That makes good sense to me. So maybe paper folding is great. Maybe that's the right way to think of exponents, uh, except for half a fold. What does it mean to fold a paper in half half a time? How many layers is that? Huh. And now, maybe paper folding is great. At least it got me two to the zero. Two to the zero is one. Uh, what about zero to the zero then? You know what? Exponents just drive me nuts. What, uh, what is zero to the zero? Is it one? Is it not one? Good question. One should really play with that, really try to nut that out because it's actually hard. Um, do we know what 0 0.9999 forever, a whole bunch of nines go infinitely far to the right? Do we know what that is? I guess we do. Um, a lot of people will tell me it's one and they might convince me as follows. Let's give it a name. So let's call 0 0.999 forever Frank F. What should I do to Frank? Most people say to me, multiply both sides by 10. Okay, so 0 0.99 multiplied by 10 would be 9.999 forever, would have to equal 10 francs. Great. Um, let me subtract those two equations. So 9.99 forever, take away 0 0.99 forever, so all the 0.9s go away, so it gives us 9 on the left, and 10 Fs take away 1 F is 9 F. And that makes it very clear that F better be 1. So that's done it. That's established that 0 0.999 forever equals 1. Great, I know something. Well, actually, I don't. Um, let me do. Let me show you why I don't know something right now. Okay, so that's great. How about infinitely nines to the left? Everyone does infinitely nines to the right, like we just did. But let me do exactly the same argument on the number da 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 nine 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 nine. So this is really ends in nine. Actually, ends in ninety nine. Actually, ends in nine hundred ninety nine. This is a number that ends in nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine. Infinitely nines to the left. Let's apply exactly the same argument. Let's call it something. Let's call it G Gloria. Um, as before, we multiply by 10, so let's multiply by 10 again. So a whole bunch of 9s, a number ending in a 9, we multiply by 10, will be a whole bunch of 9s ending in 9, 0. Great. And on the right side of G, I'll now have 10 Gs. Let's subtract. A whole bunch of 9s ending in 9 minus a whole bunch of 9s ending in 0 gives me just 9 on the left. And G, take away 10 Gs, is negative 9 Gs. So that tells me G is negative 1. So that tells me a whole bunch of 9s go infinitely far to the left equals negative 1. That is a number that ends in 9, actually ends in 99, actually ends in 999, and actually a number that ends in 9999 forever is the same as negative 1. Huh? So then I don't know anything. So there's a deep mystery and my brain is going to hurt because when I lie in bed at night I'm going to be thinking about this and trying to figure out what on earth is going on because I don't know. There is mathematics. So there's loads of deep questions to be had and they come up in the curriculum all the time and I wish people would ask. Why is the value of pi for the same for all circles? We just assume it is. I mean, we draw small circles, big circles, and we do some little experiments, but anyone check the size of a, the pi for the circle the size of the solar system? What about the value of pi for the circle the size of an atom? Is that still the same thing? Um, why circles all the time? Is there a value of pi for a square? Uh, why does the quadratic formula work? Often kids are told, here's a neat formula, and let's use it. Why does it work? Good question. And in fact, here's an even more basic question. Quad means four. Is the prefix means four, Latin for four. What have quadratics got to do with the number four? I don't, I've rarely heard any of that question asked. Um, back to very basic questions, factor trees. We often kids said factor trees and go into primes. Why do factor trees always get the same list of primes at the very end, no matter what choices you make along the way? You know, if I gave you know Sally and Ben each a, a 15,000 digit number and I asked them to factor that same number, they'll make different choices on the way. Are we sure they're going to get the same primes in the end? Is that obvious? Um, have you ever noticed that the powers of 11 are the rows of Pascal's triangle? Why? Loads of questions we had. So, you know, it's fun. It's always a bit scary to question explore. That's probably why people don't want to do it. Um, one really does need a sense of confidence and personal uh, permission to really explore and flail and figure things out for real. We don't really teach much in our curriculum how to have ki help kids figure things out, really. Um, but, you know, I believe no matter how rigid a curriculum is, um, there's always wiggle room for the true mathematical experience within it. I think you can do it. Um, that's why I left the university world to become a high school teacher. I'm really interested in trying to find that wiggle room. Where's the real math in the curriculum we have? But then, if we had major curriculum form, then now we're talking. That's not going to happen soon. But I wish, I wish we could sort of impart a message that really is okay not to know. But it'd be nice if we had to that. It's not okay to not to want to find out. All right. So there we are. So admitting that you don't know something, I think, is really the most powerful of genius principles. Um, and genius have the confidence to really pin down what it is they don't know. 
you know, it'll have to be murky, it'll be fuzzy, but trying to really identify what it is, I don't know. Um, they'll really try to muddle with things and try to figure things out, and they'll make lots of mistakes on the way. That's totally fine. But make, mistaking mistakes, so making mistakes is brilliant. And you know, this leads to true insights about what, um, what doesn't work. It really leads to understanding about what does work. And you know, it's okay to ask questions and to consult resources. It's always to go out there and, and try to find answers. But one should always respond with personal skepticism. Do I really believe that? Often people will tell me that negative times negative is positive because it just is. But maybe I shouldn't believe that. Um, maybe people tell, people tell me that value of pi is the same for all circles is just a fact. It's actually not. Um, there's skepticism to be had. And, you know, just have fun with it all. Let it be a joyful experience. So all this really does sound like great life management to me. So I wish through our mathematics curriculum we could really teach kids how to be, you know, deal with life. Life is messy. Answers aren't, aren't Answers aren't in the back of the textbook. Answers, life presents you the questions that haven't been answered before. You know, I wish life were easy this way, but this is all about muddling your way through, having the constant confidence to flail, and just really be clear on what you don't know and really taking action to try to turn that around. That would be a great gift. That, to me, is genius-like thinking. So if you're obviously watching this PowerPoint, you know that this PowerPoint presentation appears at my website because you must have found it there. But here's all the other details about me. So thanks so much for making your way through these many levels of this PowerPoint. Um, I hope it's helpful. Feel free to email me if you've got any thoughts, suggestions, comments, if you want to start a conversation. Happy to be very open to it all. Thanks so much.